Welcome. Welcome to the uh, Solomon's Legacy Society uh, program of the enabler and the bystander. Um, we appreciate your being here. Hope you enjoys, enjoyed the uh, schmooze time together. My name is Marshall Spector. I am um, a family law attorney with uh, Gewurz Menashe and chair of the Solomon's Legacy Society. Uh, as many of you know, uh, you're here today. Solomon's Legacy is an affinity group uh, sponsored by the Jewish Federation of Greater Portland and presents opportunities for the bench, the bar, and law students to, uh, to get together and to learn together um, on topics that are relevant and timely from both a Jewish and legal perspective and to increase our learning and awareness and hopefully uh, activity in, in, the, uh, in the community. Salma's legacy, uh, when it was formed many years ago, uh, was named for the late uh, longtime US District Court Judge uh, Gus Solomon. And Judge Solomon was well known uh, for welcoming new Jewish lawyers in the community and is also uh, named after uh, the wise um, King Solomon uh, from biblical times. Um, this is an opportunity and this group is hopefully in the fall we will be able to gather in person, if not uh, sometime later in the year. And it's, it's an opportunity not just to learn together, but to connect uh, legal professionals regardless of where we are in our careers, law school, retired, practicing judiciary, and we're, uh, we're excited about continuing uh, the program. Um, most of you are familiar with the Jewish Federation, but quickly, as you know, the Federation here in Portland uh, assures building and strengthening of the Jewish community here and abroad. Uh, please visit the Federation webpage uh, and also the most recent uh, issue of the Jewish Review just came out. There was a great program yesterday the Jewish uh, Federation was a part of called a community, the Community Calls to Confront Hate. Um, their Federation has been very active in the last year with uh, uh, providing essential community support for institutions and folks who have been affected by COVID. And uh, again, with the rise of anti-Semitism, Federation is funded and uh, we have a security director who's active in the community working with uh, synagogues and other, um, other institutions. The campaign is doing great this year. We appreciate everyone who's supporting the campaign. Um, and please join Federation at the June 14th um, annual meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, folks who are the committee members of our Solomon's Legacy Society, uh, Chuck Tommen, Max Forer, uh, Eric Kodish, uh, Julie Karen, Martha Eisenson, Rob Schlachter, and uh, Laura Polster. And I'd especially like to thank um, Wendy Kahn, our uh, professional from the Federation. Wendy is a consummate professional, um, makes lay leaders look good and does a perfect job in trying to balance that reminding, nudging continuum when she's not getting responses from, uh, from lay people. So I appreciate everything Wendy is doing. We have applied for CLE credits uh, for this program. Written materials uh, were provided to you yesterday. If you didn't get them, you can um, ping Wendy. And we really welcome and encourage your feedback uh, and comments and suggestions, not just on this program, but as we look to plan some programs for the fall, we would love to hear from you about what might, uh, what might be um, interesting. So time to move to our program titled The Enabler and the Bystander. Our teachers, speakers today, um, First is Rabbi Rachel Joseph of Congregation Beth Israel. And as you know, rabbis in these days have to wear many hats, so to speak. Uh, they're fundraisers, they're administrators, synagogue politics, and a lot of things. Rabbi Joseph also is truly one of the great rabbis and teachers uh, in our community. And we are fortunate to have her uh, here with us to, uh, to teach today. Uh, professor uh, Amos uh, Giora is a professor of law at the S.J. Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah. He lives part of the year in Utah, part of the year in Israel. He is in Israel now uh, and will be uh, speaking and teaching. Uh, we're glad that things are more calm than they were last week and the week before and um, hope that your, uh, your family is, um, is safe. Um, professor Giora is the author of two books, uh, Crime and Complicity, The Bystanders uh, in the Holocaust. And his most recent book is Army, Armies of Enablers, Survivor Stories of Complicity and Betrayal in Sexual, um, sexual Assault. You received uh, one, of his, um, one of his papers yesterday and um, he will be speaking on those, speaking on those topics. Um, 
He warned me that if I go through any more of his bio, that not only he would speak longer today, but he would call on me in class tomorrow. So we're going to leave the introduction um, at that. The, the timing of the program is that uh, Rabbi Joseph will uh, teach, speak first, followed by uh, Professor Giora, and after which there will be time for questions. Please put questions in the chat, and Wendy and I will kind of look through them and try to uh, pull out a combination of questions. We uh, may run out of time and not get to everything, and so we apologize um, in advance. We will uh, close the program. Uh, the, the speakers will finish around one o'clock or so. Uh, there'll be some time for, or a little before one, there'll be some time for questions, and then we'll close out uh, about 10 after one or 1.15. And um, with that, thank you for being here and uh, Rabbi Joseph. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for having me um, and to be part of the Solomon Legacy. It truly is an honor. And I um, was in politics before I became a rabbi in Washington DC and actually I always thought I was gonna be a lawyer. So as is common in the Jewish world, lawyer, rabbi, and a lot of times there's there's overlap. Um, thank you for allowing me to bring some context to this topic. Why this topic for a Jewish lawyers group? Um, and so today uh, we're going to fly through some texts and some sources just to give a background and a foundation. Um, in no way are we going to be able to really go into depth and cover everything that we want to cover. And I'm only providing the very minimum, the tip of the iceberg, just to just to give you an idea of what our tradition says. Um, and I just want to start by saying, um, having read um, Professor Giora's um, article that he sent, it was really fascinating to me because um, I hear so often and, and work with so often that our laws are based on mosaic laws, that in America, so much of our history is tied into this Judeo-Christian um, legal background and, and how he, you argue that, especially when it comes to this, it does not. And there was a, a line where you talked about in American jurisdictions and the libertarian backgrounds, which those of us in Oregon full well understand the libertarian backgrounds, um, we're more willing to accept there's no legal duty to rescue another in danger, even though a moral ob obligation might exist, that there is this distinction between legality and morality um, and further down, talking about how legislation is unnecessary because most people will just do the right thing. Very contrary to Jewish tradition. So as an over, as a overview before I share some of these texts, our tradition is based on the mitzvot, on commandments. And uh, often we're taught as kids that the commandments are good deeds. Commandments are not good deeds. Commandments are obligations. Commandments are responsibilities and actually have nothing to do with ethics. There's no distinction um, between ethics and or morality and legality. It actually is one and the same. And really our tradition says that through those responsibilities, through those obligations, through those legal obligations, morality and ethics will follow that that's how we form the society we want to form. Um, but we do first. We are the action faith. We are the action religion tradition first. And that's actually what, what our meets vote do. So um, I thought it was really interesting. And um, I know in this article, you didn't really get into some of the, the Jewish background text in that way. Um, but our tradition is so based in that. So where does it come? Oh, sorry, hold on. Where does this come from? And you you got this in your email as well, if you don't want to uh, follow along here. Um, and we'll get to, as I said here, some are guilty and all are responsible, which is an Abraham Joshua Heschel quote. Um, but we start in Torah. So we start in our first text from our Five books of Moses from Leviticus, which is really considered the law book, although laws are uh, contained in all of our books. And we read here, Lo telech b'mecha, lo ta'amod al dam ani adonai. Do not deal basely with your countrymen. Do not stand idly by the blood of your fellow. I am the Lord. I am God. So this is our proof text. This is the basis of which all these other interpretations are coming from. That here in Leviticus, it says, you don't just stand there. You cannot just watch as your fellow human being, as that other person is bleeding. Because God says, you don't get to do this, that you have to have some action. 
So what do we do with this base text as we turn to interpretations? So we can start with our good friend Rashi. Rashi um, is a medieval commentator, Shlomo Yitzhak, one of our most famous commentators um, who would take Torah text and then give us uh, a little bit of an idea of, of how to interpret that. Although Rashi is most famous for just sort of giving the shot, the here's, here's what this means. <laughs> um, and he doesn't often go into the more flowery. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, so Rashi takes this, takes this Torah text, Lotamod uh, Adam Reacha, and he says, you know, what does this mean? Witnesses his death. You're being able, you being able to rescue him. If for instance, he is drowning in the river or if a wild beast or robber is attacking him. So what, is, what does it mean that, that you're just, that you're standing there? So that you, and, and this is another thing we talk about that you're, um, that I know that um, Professor Gior talks about, that you are there, that you are physically present, that you're witnessing something that's happening. So um, they're drowning, there's a wild beast, there's a robber, there's something happened, and then you don't act. What is that? What does that mean? That we have that responsibility to act uh, in that moment. Um, so here saying that the, the simplest sense of the verse is if we see a person in danger, do not stand and bury your hand in a dish. There's a question mark, so we don't exactly know what that the Hebrew translation. You must do everything possible to save him. So like the example that was given of standing around a pond in the sort of British context and watching a child drown, you have to do everything you can to save that person or you're punished. Then we get into, um, I, I'll just bring a, a piece of, of Talmud. Um, and this is our, Talmud is our central rabbinic text. Um, and this section from Sanhedrin um, is what deals with sort of civil and criminal damages. So a lot of our, our legal laws here that the Gemara, um, that the sages taught in a Baraita and something outside of the Talmud, from where is it derived that with regard to one who pursues another in order to kill him, the pursued party may be saved at the cost of the pursuer's life? The verse states, you shall not stand idly by the blood of another. Rather, you must save him from death. The Gemara asks, but does this verse really come to teach us this? This verse is required for that which is taught in the writer. From where is it derived that one who sees another drowning in a river or being dragged away by a wild animal or being attacked by a bandit or is, is obligated to save him? And the Torah states, you shall not stand idly by the blood of another. The Gemara answers, yes, is it indeed so? that this verse relates this obligation to save one whose life is endangered. So we are, um, you know, all of these giving you, this is hundreds and hundreds of years between um, some of these different sources, you know, saying that we have the ultimate responsibility to not stand by. Um, in, our, in our next text, which is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, which is a commentary on also Jewish code of law um, from Shari Tshuva, which is the Gates of Repentance. Um, I thought this was a really interesting piece because again, it goes, what is this? And King Solomon, speaking of, King Solomon said, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Meaning if you have the power to save someone through your words or your physical actions, and you show yourself as one who's unable to do so, your own strength will be weakened measure for measure. Your own strength <laughs> will be weakened and, and diminished uh, if, you do not, if you do not act. Um, I, let's look at, I'm gonna skip because I know we are gonna run out of time, um, but there's, I encourage you to check out some of these texts. Um, I'm skipping over a um, Soloveitchik text um, dealing with the Holocaust and how do we stand by? I'm gonna come back to the Hirsch. So one of the interesting things we can also, as we look at this Torah text, we started with that text in Leviticus, Lo Ta'amod al Dam Rayacha, that as we know, the Torah was unvocalized is unvocalized, right? So there's no vowels in the Torah um, and that we were an oral tradition. So we pass this down. So there's all sorts of fun things that we can do. Um, we have vocalized it. And when we uh, read Torah, you know, we learn it from a vocalized sheet and then we move to an unvocalized. But this 
word. So this word here, this dalid mem dam that we're translating, and, and most of our text translates this as blood. If we pronounce it not as dom, but as dome. So if we change the letters, the Hebrew letters are the same. It's only the vowels that are different. We get a very different word. So we go from blood to silence. So not only is it blood, but our silence. So here, I feel like we are covering now um, both our, our bystanders and our enablers, right? That it really covers a, a, a broad swath there um, of not just life, but our silence also causes this death. Um, so I thought there was a, a beautiful piece here. Um, this comes from the 1500s where um, he explains it, Rabbi Horowitz, Lo ta'amod al maybe al dom reacha. The reason for this prohibition is simply that we are all part of one unit, responsible for each other. If we must try and save each other's bodies, how much more so must we endeavor to save each other's souls? When one sees a fellow Jew commit the kind of sin which will result in the death of his soul, one must make every effort to prevent him and not stand by idly watching him commit the scene. Lo ta'amod. Alternatively, the word dam in this context, may refer to silence, dome, a double entendre, and the Torah warns us not to remain silent, lest our blood pay for our silence. And just looping us back to the Heschel piece, so um, you've probably heard this quote before, and it comes from this prayer for peace that he gave in 1971, where he said, oh Lord, we confess our sins, we're ashamed of the inadequacy of our anguish, of how faint and slight is our mercy. We are a generation that has lost its capacity for outrage. We must continue to remind ourselves that in a free society, all are involved in what some are doing. Some are guilty and all are responsible. Um, and so I think that um, pretty strong and Heschel, right, is probably the most influential philosopher and rabbinic voice of our postmodern world. Um, so to give that from our Torah text to today's time, um, that while we might not be guilty of the crime that was committed um, by witnessing, by being silent, by being part of it, that we are responsible for that. Our tradition is quite clear on this, where our responsibility lies um, and going hand in hand. So that is to give you, to overwhelm you with some context and some introduction to um, why this is a Jewish topic um, and why lawyers would wanna think about their Jewish identity in the context of the legality of these issues. And I will turn it over. So my, I guess I'll just pick up directly from the rabbi. Um, by way of quick introduction, um, as Marshall said, I live in, Israel, live in Israel, teach at the University of Utah. The two books that are relevant to this conversation, The Crime of Complicity, The Bias State, and The Holocaust, and Armies of Enablers About Sexual Assault. Um, I told the, the distinguished organizers who were gracious enough to interview, to invite me today, I have zero, 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 zero expertise in um, Jewish text, Jewish scripture, Jewish law, so I leave all that um, to the rabbi. Um, how did I come to this project and how does, and see if I can tie this all together. I served for 20 years um, in the IDF, so all of my writing has been a national security until, until eight years ago when I was training for the Salt Lake Marathon, my running partner who's not Jewish asked me, how did this, this being the Holocaust, how did this happen? And even though both of my parents are Holocaust survivors, and a you know a reasonably intelligent person, I had a brilliant academic answer to the running partner, which was I have no idea, which is you know at least being honest. And the reason is for one because I was my parents never discussed the Holocaust with me at all at all whatsoever, and two because I guess I chose the easy way out living in in, in Ann Arbor that you just go on with your life as in Ann Arbor. So I decided I'm 64 on Monday. I finally reached the the Beatles iconic. Will you still need me? Will you still love me? but I was 55 or so when all this transpired. And I decided that the time has come to A, understand something about the Holocaust and B, and perhaps more importantly, to figure out who the hell my parents are. So 
I undertook a self-study about the Holocaust and I'll obviously never say read, you've read everything about the Holocaust because that's impossible. But the more I read, there was one issue that was of great interest to me and that is the bystander. And to make a very long story short because time is limited for reasons that I will never understand. My book is the first one that addresses the question of the, the, the legal question of the bystander in the Holocaust. There are two other books about the bystander. One is um, by Victoria Barnett, it's a great book. And the other one is by Hilberg, Bystanders, Perpetrators and Victims. He's, he's a historian, she's a um, sociologist, but mine is the first one to look at it through the lens of the law. Um, why was I the first one? Hell if I know. But what became clear to me as I researched my parents is that without the bystander, the Holocaust never happens. So with all due respect to Hitler and friends, yay for them, they knew that the bystander or the, rather the population would bystand or the population would be bystanders. And what enables the, the Holocaust is the bystander. I mean, we can talk about Hitler until tomorrow morning. And yes, there was Nuremberg and that's fine. Yay, that's not the point. It is the, and the, the, the decision, and it is a decision, it's a rational decision. You may not like the decision, but it's a rational decision by an individual to stand by and see the peril of another human being. And so that first book is about that. And then I thought I was done with this whole thing about the bystander, because it really is not my area whatsoever. And I met with my publisher, who's the American Bar Association in Chicago a couple of years ago. And he says, well, you're a big sports fan. I said, I am. He says, well, you've heard about the Catholic Church. And I said, I have. He says, so why don't you write a book about some, something else related to the bystander? And I agreed. And why I agreed, I have no idea. But that led, um, I wish I could tell you that he plowed me with alcohol, but I don't drink. Um, so probably gave me a big piece of cake, which I, I assume was good. And that's how it led to, the, to this book, The Armies of Enablers. And what I did for that book is over the course of 15 months or so, I interviewed 20 to 25 sexual assault survivors, men and women alike, from Michigan State, USA Gymnastics, Catholic Church, and Ohio State. I wanted to interview the boys at Penn State, but I couldn't get to them. Um, but what became clear to me, there's the bystander, and that's the person who's physically there when something happens to another person. You know, you fall on the street, you have some medical emergency or the two guys fighting, but the, the bystander is there, has the capability to act because everybody has a cell phone. I mean, you know, babies are born with cell phones. Um, and that's distinct from the enabler. The enabler is not physically present. The enabler is the person who knew or should have known about the peril of another person. And the best way I can explain that the, the enabler to use in the, the following couple of vignettes, those of you who are sports, sports fans, the names may be familiar to you. Um, Tiffany Thomas Lopez was one of America's great women's softball players, recruited to Michigan State. She goes to Michigan State. She's assaulted by Larry Nassar. That's the guy who assaulted the girls at USA Gymnastics and uh, Michigan State. She's assaulted by Nassar about 150 times. And she decides that finally enough is enough, Dainu. And she goes to the, um, to the softball trainer, a woman named Hayden. And well, we're all adults here, right? She doesn't tell Hayden what Nassar is doing. She shows to Hayden on Hayden's body what Nassar has been doing to her 150 times. And Hayden's reaction is, oh my God, this is really bad. Well, yeah, duh, it is. And what Hayden does is ultimate enabler is she sends Tiffany, a student athlete, to the head trainer, a woman named Destiny, who's pure evil. And what Destiny does is along with the coach, she manipulates to have Tiffany removed from the team. So let's think about it in the context of the victim, because for me, the only person who's relevant in this entire conversation, I think this ties into the rabbi's words, is the person who's in peril. And the question is, what duty do we owe the person in peril? And for me, in terms, again, not in Jewish scripture, I leave that to the rabbi, but for me, in terms of the law, the law is, it needs to be perfectly clear here that the, the duty is owed to the person who's in peril. And um, I've been very involved in the past four or five years in criminalizing the bystander. We had great success in the state of Utah in March. Um, in March, the governor signed a bill that's a combination bill of um, uh, mandatory reporting slash bystander. And if you're a mandatory reporter and or bystander and you see a child in peril or a vulnerable adult in peril, you have to be a bystander, you have to be present. Um, one, if you're a teacher, um, law enforcement or in social services, you will lose your job. In addition to losing your job, you will go to jail for up to six months and you will be fined $1,500. So this is pretty um, pick your poison aggressive or assertive criminalization of the bystander, which from my perspective is absolutely necessary. So the new project, and Rabbi, I appreciate the, the text you put up there. I need to tell you, I immediately screenshot it because 
Um, I'm testifying in Australia next month in the Australian parliament where there's an Australian legislator who is very intrigued with the notion of criminalizing the enabler. I already sent your, your wise words to the people I'm working with. Um, so we can work it into my testimony, which I'm preparing um, for Australia. Thank you very much. Um, because I, I think that criminalizing the enabler is the next step in, I hate the word, in this legislative journey. Because people who are in a position of power who know about the peril of another and choose not to act or are dismissive of the person in peril are perhaps, I mean, I don't wanna say who's better and who's worse. Are they as bad as the bystander? I don't know, we can have a discussion about that, but there's certainly no better. So you have to view it from the perspective of the survivors. I'll give you another example. Lindsay Lemke was the captain of the Michigan State softball team. She's assaulted by Nasser, who knows how many times. She goes to her coach and she tells coach Clagus that this is what's been happening and that she, Lemke, is going to go to the police. And um, the coach says to her three sentences. Sentence number one, Lindsay, I want you to think about how this will impact Larry and his family. Well, no, she doesn't have to think about that at all. Two, she says, you know, I'm going to have to talk to your parents. Absolutely not. Lemke's 21 years old. You don't need to talk to your parents. And the third thing she says to her is the kicker. She says, Lindsay, I remind you, scholarships are given and scholarships are taken. That's a pure threat. Um, and for that, Kathy Clagus ended up in jail, which is a good place for her to be. Um, she was sentenced to four months. Unfortunately, because of COVID, she was reduced to three months. But if you think about it from the perspective of the student athlete who comes to you know, the coach, the iconic coach, and the, the coach just turns their back, not the bystander, but the enabler, for me, in context of, of duty, um, there is no doubt that that kind of behavior cannot be tolerated. But when I say cannot be tolerated, it's not in the context of, 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 of faith or morality. It's in the context of the law, which then leads to the article that I sent you all, uh, which the rabbi referenced, the crime of omission. So I know that for lawyers and all of your lawyers and some of you are gonna shake your head and say to me, well, we can't really criminalize omission. Yes, we wanna criminalize commission, but this whole thing about omission really makes me uncomfortable because how is it that you can criminalize me for not doing something? You know, my response to that is if you don't stop at a traffic light, we'll criminalize you. And if you don't pay your taxes, I remind you your, your taxes were due April 15th unless you applied for the um, extension. You don't pay your taxes, you didn't do it. That's a crime of omission, you get penalized. For reasons that are unclear to me, as much as I've tried to understand it, I want to be sympathetic to those who disagree with me. The notion of criminalizing omission is something that for, for lawyers is, is, is a huge mountain to climb. Um, I don't know why. Um, I've never, I mean, I've heard the arguments. They don't convince me, but maybe one of you can convince me that at least I have an understanding why it's so difficult to criminalize omission. From the perspective of the survivor, there's no difference between omission and commission, so much so that the more survivors I talk to, and I generally wake up most mornings to emails from survivors who have never heard of me, but have heard me speak or have read about me. Um, here's what they tell me. One, more often than not, when they came forward to complain, they were not believed. Statistics show that something like 90% of sexual assault survivors when they come forward are, are not believed. Um, I, I'm gonna have to fudge the facts, but there's even this case um, where the sexual assault survivor I'm not making this up. Uh, she was polygraphed, um, which is so beyond outrageous. There are no words. That's problem number one. Number two is 95 to 97% of sexual assault survivors tell the truth when they come forward. So not only do they not believe, but at the end of the day, they told the truth. For law enforcement, when if you come forward to law enforcement and say, my car was stolen, the, law, the cops will say, yeah, I'm really sorry. Let's deal with it. You come forward and you talk, say, I was sexually assaulted. The instinctual response among law enforcement, we see it time after time after time after again, is not to believe. But that also extends to sexual assault advocates and Title IX advocates and so on. We could have a long discussion as to why, but that's the reality. The enablers, those who should have known or knew, as far as I can tell, have five different reasons for not acting. I need to add in parentheses, there's never been empirical research done on this. So what I'm telling, sharing with you is based on anecdotal evidence, evidence in quotations, because there's no empirical study on this. Um, and a lot of this comes from the, from the athletes who I interviewed. Um, so take it in that context. One, many, I know this will make some of you uncomfortable, boo-hoo, many of the enablers are women. That's the truth. Um, and as a matter of fact, I have a call this Sunday with a sexual assault social worker who's a woman. She and I are going to begin undertaking a study to examine why women enable. I wanna be very clear about this. The majority of the enablers who I've interacted, who I've encountered in the last three years are women. Um, 
it is, it is what it is. So why are, why do people enable? One, the athletes tell me, this comes from the athletes, because I told you people interviewed people from the Olympics as well. A lot of the trainers, women trainers, women coaches, they don't like the athletes. Um, they're jealous of them. The athletes are super successful. A lot of them are, you know, they look good. They're in great, great shape. And there's some jealousy factor. It is what it is. Two, a lot of the enablers view this from their financial perspective. If you know, if you're a whistleblower, you're gonna pay a, a certain cost to that. There's a problem with that. Three, a lot of the enablers identify with the institution rather than identify with the individual, which I think Rabbi goes to the, to the text that you showed with us in terms of, is your duty to the institution, is your duty to the person? For a lot of enablers are simply ap apathetic. They, you know, they, they just don't really care. And five, or which is maybe related to the first one, a lot of the enablers don't like the survivors. And the survivors are very much aware of that, especially women survivors, know that women enablers don't like them. But if you take the rabbi's um, um, uh, screenshots, if that's what it's called, right? Um, and you take the enablers and take the bystanders, there are three themes that I suggest we think about. One is responsibility. The other is accountability, and the third is transparency. What the survivors demand, and this is where criminalizing the enabler um, plays a role, is enforcing or instituting accountability. And accountability not as in, gosh, I should have done better, boo hoo, but um, clearly accountability as in criminalization, paying a price, that's one to this whole notion of responsibility. Maddie Larson, again, those of you who are sports fans will recognize the name. Um, Maddie Larson, um, who was one of America's great gymnasts, um, Larry Nasser sexually assaulted Maddie um, 750 times. Um, and when she was um, 13 or 14, that's when it began. So she tells me the following story. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but when the Olympic team travels, they travel, they, the, the girls sleep in two, two or four to a room and Nasser, the doctor was in a room by himself. So Maddie is sent at the age of 14 to Larry Nasser's room by him, by herself at night for treatment, wink, wink. So I asked Maddie the one question that drives is the book. And that is what were your expectations of the enabler? And her answer was clear to be protected. And then the obvious follow-up question is, okay, and how do you feel when being sent as a 14-year-old child in, at night to a man's hotel room when he's alone in his hotel room? And her answer is clear. And this goes exactly to um, the text of the, again, I leave the text, textual analysis to the rabbi, but I know enough to tell you that what she said, what she felt was that she was abandoned. And it is that abandonment that absolutely drives for me the what do we do with, with the enabler? And the third point, and that's the responsibility. And the third point is transparency. So this comes from Maddie. Um, well, you can watch her on YouTube. She's an extraordinary athlete. She's like five two, right? But, she, but this extraordinary athlete. And here's what she says: Nothing, but nothing, but nothing drives her badier than those endless press releases that organizations put out, where they say there's nothing more important to us than the welfare and the well-being of our athletes, for whom we are dedicated and we care most about. It's absolute bullshit. Because what these institutions really care about is themselves, and there's a lot of financial investment or financial benefit to them, which then leads me to the next point. So if we have the enabler and the bystander and institutions, the magical phrase that I'm trying to work into the lexicon is institutional complicity. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. That the enablers um, protect the institution, which benefits the institution. And time after time and time after time again, we see institutional complicity, whereby the survivor, the person in peril um, can be easily discarded um, or in Maddie's words, um, we were disposable, not my word, her word. And I think the, the notion of a survivor feeling that they are disposable is something that none of us um, should tolerate. So the question is, where do we go with all this and what do we do with all this? And that, by the way, is the, was the reason I was so delighted to have the opportunity to chat with you all. I made a promise to all the survivors that I've met with and continue meeting with that I would do two things. One is to be involved in legislative efforts, which you know I am. And two, to meet with groups like this to at least begin a conversation about this notion of responsibility, accountability, um, transparency with respect to the bystander and the enabler. 
we as society have it's a, it's it's a, it's black and white. There ain't no gray here. I mean, you can either say to yourself, "Oh gosh, you know, bad things happen, boohoo," but you know what's for dinner, or you can say, "Enough is enough." You know, I'm gonna speak as we say in Hebrew, and we're going to um, work together to address um, institutional complicity, institutional actors. I get asked a lot, what do I think about university presidents who screw up? I say, fire them, the hell with them. The next person, bring them in. Um, because the question is either you're going to tolerate what for me is intolerant behavior, behavior that shouldn't be tolerated, or are you going to consistently make do what we all do is with make excuses, it was, he's not really that bad or she's not really that bad. Absolutely incorrect. So I know that, because um, I read the criticism of me, um, I'm aware of the fact that there's a criticism of me that I'm too survivor focused. Um, my response to that is I can live with that. I mean, there are worse things in life. Um, I also know that there were a lot of death threats directed at me after the first book came out, the Holocaust book. But I guess if you write a book about the Holocaust, you get death threats. It is what it is. Um, for me, this is not only about the survivors who were assaulted past, but it's very much also about survivors' future. Because here's the reality is we're having this lovely conversation 10.41 p.m. here in Israel. Um, which I believe makes it 1242 um, Pacific Standard Time, we all know that someone has just been attacked. And if you don't know that, here's reality. Someone has just been sexually attacked somewhere. And someone knew that that person was being attacked. And it, one of the things that I have now realized, having spent so much time with sexual assault survivors, um, most attacks, overwhelming majority of attacks are not done by the gnarly guy in the, in the alley. That's in the movies. That's not real life. Most sexual assault survivors know their assailant. Whether it was a date rape that went bad, I've, you know, I've met with people who date rapes went bad, whether it's you know, Larry, the Larry Nassers of the world or the doctors at the University of Michigan, Ohio State, and go on and on and on. People know their assailant. And if people know their assailant, it means that those who could have protected the person also knew. And so I need to leave you with one last story and then we can turn over to questions. So you write books like this and obviously people reach out to, um, and so I'm writing a new book um, with a guy named John Vaughn. All of you can Google John Vaughn, V-A-U-G-H-N. First name John G-O-N. Vaughn played football at the University of Michigan and then played in the NFL. Um, Vaughn is one of the 950 former University of Michigan student athletes who have filed a lawsuit against Michigan because over the course of 50 years, 5-0, one doctor, a guy named Bob Anderson, who's now dead, sexually assaulted, abused, raped between six to 9,000 University of Michigan student athletes. But you have to ask yourself, how can it be that one guy for 50 years? I mean, what? And here's the answer. Um, and I, Vaughn and I are playing Woodward and Bernstein and, and putting, piecing the puzzle together. It's clear that senior University of Michigan officials knew what Anderson was doing. But because the brand, the brand, the brand of Michigan and protecting Michigan was a hell of a lot more important than protecting the John Vaughns of the world. Those senior officials made a pact with the devil and that pact with the devil was to protect Anderson, obviously, but more importantly, to protect the University of Michigan. I also need to add in full disclosure, while all this was happening at Michigan, my late father was, an, was a professor at the University of Michigan Medical School. Um, all this broke after my dad died, so I, you know, I can't ask him what he knew or what, what friends of his knew. But what is clear to me, and we know this, we can document this, Athletic director knew, athletic director knew, football coach knew, wrestling coach knew, two um, university officials knew, maybe a third university official knew, and they all did the same thing, nothing. And for the from the perspective of, of Vaughn, who's leading the, the fight, and I need to add one more word about Vaughn, what makes him unique, he's the first African-American male to come forward and talk openly about being raped. Um, those of you who are not tied into the African-American community, I'm not sure you fully understand what it means for an African-American alpha male NFL guy to come forward and to acknowledge that as a 20-year-old, he was raped. Um, it is enormously complicated. Um, and that's why, it's, for me, it's an honor to write this book with, with um, John. Um, but we also know that what happened in Michigan happens here, 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 and here. So I leave you with this before we turn over to questions. We can all go home, watch TV, and say, great, you know, shit happens. Or we can say enough and agree that at least we have to have the conversation and that we have to at least understand that from the survivor's perspective, the measures against the assailant are far from enough. The survivors tell me the following, that the, the assailant, whether it's Nasser or others, occupy literally no space in their brain, literally. 
the person who absolutely occupies space in their brain is the enabler. I spoke with a woman who was date raped. It was a violent date rape. And here's what she tells me. The rape was bad, duh. But she says, you know, she's not pissed at the guy because he was an idiot and she was an idiot. You know what happens. Turns out the same guy had raped before, safe to assume raped after the police when she went and reported you all know the usual lines, honey, what did you wear? Honey, you wanted it, honey, how was it? And then of course they lost the rape kit, obviously, duh. Those are enablers. So from her perspective, it's not the assailant who worries her, you know, blah. It's in her case, it's the police with those awful, awful, awful questions magnified by losing the rape kit. Um, that's where we are. And if you tie everything back together, we, the bystander is easy because you're there. The enabler is more complicated um, we have, from my perspective, zero choice. We have to act. Because if we don't, all we're doing is um, ensuring the continued peril of not only the survivor of just now, but the survivor of in two minutes' time. On that note, thank you. Professor, thank you so much. Uh, question, question to start. What, what do you know and what else is going on in other states around the country? Uh, with the type of legislation that uh, that you've been working on in Utah? So there are 10 other states that have bystander legislation. There are 28 countries that have bystander legislation. There is no jurisdiction that, that has uh, enabler legislation, which is why I'm so honored um, um, that the legislator in Victoria reached out to me. And by the way, I need to add that there's a team of us who are working on my testimony. Those of you who testified before know that it's an enormous amount of work. So there are five of us working on my testimony and the hope is that if it goes well in Victoria, that um, we can bring it to other, juris other jurisdictions. Okay. Thanks. We have a question in the, uh, in the chat from uh, Julie. Are you involved with the uh, Biden administration making changes to Title IX regulations? Uh, where the previous administration created great barriers to survivors bringing complaints forward. Yeah, so um, Julie, the previous administration, because um, we have to be, we're in polite company here, caused unbelievable damage and harm to Title IX. Um, and I'm hoping that the Biden administration, indeed, in the terms of the changes it's seeking to make, um, will be effective. I know there are lawyers who, who wanted to sue the Trump administration after the Title IX regs came out because they were so anti-survivor. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play itself out moving forward, but you're absolutely right that there's a, the Title IX at the moment um, is not reflective of, of what I think Birch Bayh intended when he you know, drafted the legislation in the 70s. If you really follow this stuff carefully, the case, the, the institution where Title IX is going to play itself out is at Louisiana State University. Um, there's, there have been a couple of lawsuits that have been filed in the last couple of weeks against LSU for 50 million, 75 million. Um, the, the lead, the name that's important there is a, is a, um, it's a tennis player named Jade Lewis, um, who was um, sexually assaulted and brutalized by her football playing boyfriend. And, um, she reported it and to her coaches who dismissed her. And then the same assailant raped, assaulted three or four other girls. Um, and that's why LSU has been slammed with two or three lawsuits totaling, again, I think 50 and $75 million. But I need to add 50, $50 million for an institution is how much it costs you to buy your coffee at Starbucks this morning. It's nothing. The question is whether or not we're going to criminalize and put these, the, those responsible in jail. Ivan asks, have you seen results in the number of perpetrators brought to account or in, uh, in abuse situations avoided? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I just had a conversation, Ivan, with someone the other day about trying to um, create distinct data points for this and for reasons that I'm not sure why, um, there's insufficient numbers that about what you're asking about the, the abuse situations avoided. I, and I wish I could provide my, well, obviously you, but also myself and, and in terms of testimony with better numbers, unfortunately I don't have it. But I do need to ask, am I allowed to ask a question? Ivan, are you with Perkins Coie? <laughs> 
I was. When did we know each other? I knew we knew each other. How are you? It's good to see you. Was it in Israel? No, but I'll tell you, offline, I'll tell you how we know each other. Okay. But my question is, we have re mandatory recorded reporting requirements in the state of Oregon you for do. lawyers such as us. So have we had those cases? Have we had they occurred? I mean, it seems to me many cases we're dealing about real um, pathologies in human nature. Absolutely correct. Which are not necessarily um, susceptible to criminal um, correction. And that's the real worry. You know, we're, we're doing all these things. We pass these laws, government takes action, but does it change things? And, and Professor, to, to, to follow up on that with the mandatory reporting, obviously the reporting is uh, by its nature confidential. Uh, the, the reporter is. Well, so there's still confidential reporting, but sometimes there are statistics about numbers of items reported, events. Yeah. I don't, I, it's so, so funny. I mean, somebody just the other day was asking me what, what, where do we get, get numbers from? Um, I don't have a great answer for you and I'm too old to BS you. So I don't have a great answer for you. But I do think that while well, mandatory reporting is fine, yay. The question is what do we do when you fail to mandatory report? And that's why the Utah legislation is so important because often you go to jail. I'm a big believer in jail, jail's good. And I'm a big believer in firing you, firing you is good. I'm also a big believer in, in, in imposing a financial sentence on you. But I view this again only through the lens of the survivors because those are the only people I care about. Marshall, back to you. Other questions, folks? Uh, no. Oh, Nadine's asking about rehab in jail. So that's an interesting question. I, you know what? I turned that over to the rabbi. Rabbi, I turned rehabilitation over to you. I have questions too. I mean, we, as a Jewish tradition, we believe in Yeshiva. So we believe in restorative justice and that there's always a chance to do better, to turn around, to not miss the mark. I mean, and I think, you know, it's interesting because judicial reform is a huge topic in the religious community um, because the idea is to not just be sent away somewhere in a system in which there is no path towards how are you going to then reintegrate into society and not make that same mistake again, right? Because repentance for Jews means you're presented in the same scenario and you choose differently. Um, so, I mean, we're, I, 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 would, I would hope that in your construct, that's the point also of going to jail, right? Is it's a punishment, but it's also a, a chance for reformation. Or, um, <laughs> you know, just the punishment part. <laughs> I leave the other stuff to you. We can, do, we can do a dog and pony show. Can I ask a question? Please. Um, you were you were talking about why women are enablers and looking into that. And what I did not hear you say, and I'm curious, is I wonder if uh, one of maybe the number six is also about being conditioned. Something that I've noticed in generations, um, and somebody actually meant uh, mentioned that movie. Um, uh, shoot, what is it called? Pull it back up. Promising young woman. Promising young woman. So I'm 44, and I really liked the movie. But I noticed I'm right in that place where the people older than me didn't want to talk to me about it. Younger than me, I mean, all the 20 year olds I know in my office think it's the best thing they've ever seen. And I think some of it, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm curious through your research to find out also if there's a way in which we have been conditioned to say this is this is what happens. And we just have to accept it and suck it up. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that it's gonna be different with that. I'm so happy to hear, you know, the, the younger generation say, uh-uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna take this. I'm not gonna stand, I'm not gonna stand for abuse and, you know, sexism and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I know you're talking about a much uh, broader topic, but I, I just, it was one of the things that sort of occurred to me in, um, so in the list of everything else. So the notion of, of um if this is the right word, of being conditioned, um, or what Nadine here writes about enablers being survivors, right? Um, I teach a class on this stuff to undergraduates at the U, uh, and it's, it's, you know, we're all adults here, right? Um, the statistics are that one out of four college women, no, one out of four women on college campus in the United States of America today are sexually assaulted. That's the number. 
You also need to know that if one out of four are, are reporting being assaulted, you know the number is much higher than that. Um, so I taught a class with 20 students, 15 of them were women, which tells me that X number of them were sexually assaulted. So it's actually interesting, interesting, it's a shitty word, but interesting to teach this because what they're really focused on, and Rabbi, this goes to your point and also to Nadine's, is trying to create different categories um, of where blame can be um, assigned and where blame can't be assigned. Um, for me, you know, when I teach this class in the law hat, um, I think the only way we can really impact change, I know there's a carrot, but I really do believe in the stick, um, is in terms of, of, of criminalizing this. Um, if we don't do make that kind of significant shift, nothing will change. Um, Julie, you asked also, I see here about the, um, uh, the, the middle, the, the outside of that. Um, uh, yeah, we, that, it's a great question that could, we could go on um, for hours to discuss that. I get the question, but it's a, it's a, long, it's a long response. Let me, let me jump in. Um, Paul, you had a question. You patiently had your uh, hand raised. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, Paul Diller from Willamette Law School. Great to see you. This is a great talk. Uh, this is not my we, area. We share a barber. I can see that from 10,000 miles away. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I just was thinking, you know, I read today in the paper that uh, the president of Penn State is going to jail. Spencer, uh, finally. I thought, yeah, I thought, oh, what, what was that? I, I looked it up. It was endangering the welfare of a child. Yes. So those laws have been around for a while. I, it just had me wondering, are there laws already on the books or that predate the laws you are proposing that could be used uh, or prosecutors have tried to use to go after enablers or is there just a total void? Void. By if the way, it's Spanier, Spanier goes to jail for endangering a child because of, of what Sandusky was doing in the showers at Penn State. Um, which was obviously horrible. Um, the answer to your question is void. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time with legislators from different states and different countries by now. Um, for reasons, Paul, that I can't really express, explain to you sufficiently. I mean, I can repeat to you what they say, but I'm not going to, to convince you because I'm not convinced, right? Um, this notion of, of, of criminalizing the bystander, the enabler under the umbrella, right umbrella of omission is something that legislators are um, genuinely hesitant um, to do. And when you bring them, and I have been working with a legislator in, in, in Utah, Brian King, uh, I don't have heroes, but if I, had, if I did have heroes, he'd be my hero. Um, we had a hell of a time convincing the le Utah legislature that it's okay to criminalize omission. I mean, it's okay. The world will continue. Um, and there are various reasons given. I don't find any of them convincing. But again, but I, I told you now only three times that for me, life runs through the, through, um, the lens of the survivor. And the, survivor, when the survivors really believe that the neighbor needs to be penalized. And not just, gosh, this was really bad, but penalized, as in penalized. I don't have a more articulate answer for that. I want to uh, maybe follow up with Jeff's question that's there in the chat, if there's anything more to offer uh, on that and the prime, what the primary objections are to this type of legislation. Yes, there are five reasons that were given. One is that bystander legislation will flood the 911 system. Um, and we did a pretty um, wide search on that, and there's no evidence of that whatsoever. Two, that 911 legislation or bystander legislation will result in an abundance of civil suits. We found no um, evidence of that whatsoever. Three, the libertarian argument that you know, too much government, we don't need more government. Four um, is what is called a Utah-centric argument, which is we, as we are good people. We as people of faith don't need the law to tell us what to do because we know what to do. Um, and um, the fifth reason was the only one that I find compelling, and that is that this might lead to prosecutorial abuse of prosecutorial discretion, particularly with respect to minorities. 
Um, I gave a talk um, while writing the book at the University of Virginia Law School. And there was an African-American student um, who stood up. Um, it, was, it was a terrible moment. I and mean, she was crying, it was awful. And here's what she said to me. She said, you know, when people like you, meaning me, upper middle class white guy, professor of law, calls the police, the immediate assumption is that you are a victim. When we African-Americans dial 911, the immediate assumption is that we're the perp. And I told her that, and she was crying and it was, the, the room went totally silent, it was awful. Um, I thought that's a really powerful argument. I came back and I said to Representative King, I said, Brian, we gotta address this issue. Um, you know, we met with prosecutors, we met with the defense bar. By the way, the defense bar did not oppose this legislation, but we are aware um, about, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in Israel, you all are in America at the moment. Um, I don't know if the word is targeting of minority communities or the relationship between minority communities and law enforcement, but um, we're aware of that possibility. Uh, and I thanked her, obviously, for being honest enough to stand up in front of her 99% white classmates and speaking very honestly as an African-American woman, I cannot imagine how difficult that was. But she, she made a great point. Uh, last uh, question or comment, which uh, Jeff Edelson has in the chat here, and Professor, I wonder if you'd like to comment on that, that if the um, majority of the bystanders and enablers are women, then adding criminal penalties would, would result in more imprisonment of women. From the survivor's perspective, so what? He or she or he, she, if they committed a crime, criminalize it, off they go. I'm, I'm, for me, kind of speaking as not as a spokesman, because that's a, a mantle I would never assume, but sharing with you what they share with me, they would shrug and say, okay. Point, next. Sorry. I mean, I'm not being rude, but I'm just sharing with you how they would react. Right. Rabbi, any, uh, any final comments? <laughs> Following that, uh, <laughs> I think there's a lot, there's a lot to think about. And I'm, I'm glad that, or I'm lucky in that um, I chose this path. So in this world, I get to be a little bit more nuanced. Um, although I really appreciate sort of the, the definitive nature of uh, legal expertise and and so much to think about. Well, I didn't bring this text, but I, I have been thinking of another one of our important biblical texts, um, which is Kol Arvim Zebazeh, that we are all responsible for each other. Um, and I think ultimately one of the distinctions between Judaism and, and our tradition and American tradition and libertarianism is that we are about community, that what is one affects all. And going back to that idea of while you might not be guilty, that you are responsible, you are part of this, that you don't get to just remove yourself um, from what's happening around you and, and sit in your house um, away from everything. So I really just appreciate you um, bringing this topic and letting us sort of delve into this, wrestle with this. Um, and I hope that we can have more conversation about what that means for Oregon too, as we, as we move forward. Rabbi Joseph and Professor Giora, thank you so much for uh, for your participation today and for teaching us. Uh, Professor Giora's book uh, will be available. Uh, you'll be getting an email from Wendy following the program, uh, thanking you for attending and a link to his books will be available. And I would encourage you to continue to read and follow uh, his work over the years. We appreciate your participation uh, on Zoom in this and uh, hope your families are well, you have a good summer. Uh, please provide feedback to us on this program and also uh, ideas for future programs. You can email or call me uh, or you can email or call Wendy at the Federation. And uh, <clears throat> we look forward to hopefully seeing uh, everybody in person at some point, hopefully in the fall for our next program. So um, thank you everybody. And again, Rabbi and Professor, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe in Israel, sending lots of love and shalom and shleimut your way. Thank you very much.